put in a comment before I start my presentation related to um, Steve Murdoch's presentation and, and Dennis uh, Maletti's comments about it. Um, the, the concept of the prospect of enhanced challenges and disaster impact as a result of the decline of capacity of communities to support their citizens in uh, honorable and productive and remunerative jobs and the quality of life that comes with that uh, in a community. Um, I'd like to, to start my talk with a little bit about my credentials because once we get to a certain age, you feel the need to express how long we've been at this business. And my co-collaborators of my first projects are here in the room, so we'll show you how long of tooth we are. 27 years ago, we had the um, El Nino floods north of New Orleans in the Pearl River Basin. And lo and behold, I discovered that people were doing mitigation with no federal support. No government, no government support whatsoever. And even as a novice mitigation specialist at the time, it dawned on me that something here was new. And so um, this man up here with the white shirt was running for the presidency of the ASFPM at the time. And you know how he's a quiet and shy person. So <laughs> I found out who he was, and I waited outside the room, you know, diligently, this young assistant professor, you know. He comes out, and I go up to him, and I say, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. I'm running for the presidency of the ASFPM. <laughs> Boom! I thought, Boom. that's not how the, he was described. But after he won the election, served his office, and he came back as the French Wetmore that we all know and love. And we uh, <laughs> worked uh, together for several years on this topic, both in Louisiana and in Illinois, and on French's workshops, which were called Flood? The open houses. Open houses, okay. So he was one of the first to really have the PI approach to, uh, to mitigation. And Karen reminded me, you know, we always do, now do our good politics in the ladies' room. I saw her in, I think it was the ladies' room yesterday, and she said, remember, it was FEMA who funded you all for a very small amount of money. So I guess you got perhaps a, your proportional money's worth at that time. And it went into a hazard center, a monograph, and some publications, and that's the beginning of the 27 years that brought me to this point. So I'm going to talk with you about a concept that we're calling the Oval Table. And I've subtitled it, Providing a Safe Borderland for a Synergistic Mitigation Engagement. And I want to tell you how it, how it came to be, and it has to do with those 27 years I just mentioned. Um, I've concluded now that I'm two years uh, into uh, quote-unquote retirement, which as you know in the disaster world is only happens when you actually drop dead, you know, uh, that um, we all do get grumpy at this stage of our lives. And two of my very favorite people, one of them just recently deceased, who are some of the grumpiest and the most brilliant are Ray Burby, and you know he's alive and well and continuing to be grumpy, and um, Bill Freudenberg, who two years ago did the plenary here and passed in December. And both of them could not contain the fact that the world could not, cannot, because Ray still cannot, the, the world does not listen to the good opinions, scientifically based, that these, these two people have. Uh, that floodplains will be developed regardless of what you do in communities is something that Ray discerned in a very scientific fashion, and no one will listen to him about that, nor the advice he wants to give us with regard to how to mitigate that. And Bill Freudenberg worked with us on the Mississippi River Gulf outlet catastrophes in the making and could not stop saying that if we found ways to make it unprofitable for developers and growth machines to develop risky areas, you know what? They wouldn't develop them. So I found myself getting grumpy last year because uh, the state of Louisiana really doesn't, has not historically and currently, does not have a lot of affection for mitigation. I'm going to tell you I have to call it non-structural because we are in the world of the core. And so we're not equals among equals, and that's the vocabulary that we all use. So there's no love for non-structurals. And Garrett Graves, who came in from Washington, um, Margaret knows him well, to lead our post-Katrina Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, um, non-structural, it doesn't work for him. So he had me on two levy panels, the Morganza to the Gulf and the Donaldsonville. 
And um, I told them that, you know, I really couldn't believe that the state didn't want to deal with non-structurals. In fact, I yelled at him about it. <laughs> and I threatened to resign from the committees. And then I knew that I had to stop this nonsense because obviously his air flaps had closed and so had the people under him and I wasn't going to get any traction. So last year, an architect whose name is Elizabeth English, who was basically drummed out of LSU because she had two good ideas in my opinion and they had to do with floating houses, which now even FEMA is willing to talk with her about in, in certain conditions. Um, they have to, the, the houses have to currently be able to uh, satisfy the NFIP requirements, but she's made a lot of progress on this concept that you might be able to have houses rise and, and go up and down depending upon the water. Because you know the Dutch do it, I'm not sure, and you probably saw it Miriam, when you were in the Netherlands on your Fulbright. And there were enough people whom I knew who were, I call them technically knowledgeable about non-structural, in, in the town for her meeting that Chris was able to find a Presbyterian church up the street. It's always good to have good religious friends in, in your circle of close friends. And the library had an oval table, okay? Well, uh, the young man who now co-chairs co this committee with me uh, decided he would coin the, the group, the oval table. But with the symbolism that the core sits at one point of the oval, the state sits at the other point because we're not all equals among equals, you see? And so that title has, has taken, and the, or, the group has started to gain momentum and, and itself, itself have, have some, some legs. Now, the concept as we are organizing it has to do with the work that Chris has just completed for her dissertation. And it has, it, I, I recommend you to read her dissertation, and it might not even put you to sleep, okay, as most dissertations do. Bill's nodding, uh, read about him. Because the dissertation is about us. She does participatory action research, which usually means that you focus on engaging communities. But her, she reversed the question, what happens to us when we engage with communities? Now we expected that Rosina and Grand Bayou was gonna be the, um, the focus of her dissertation, but instead, Rosina and Grand Bayou become the crossover group who come to, to here, come to the Hazard Center conferences, and have been the medium by which we have grown in terms of appreciating communities. So Chris's theory is that in a borderland, you need to have people see that they are safe and being able to articulate. And this is what happened with Cindy this morning and Roy, because uh, I asked Cindy if she might comment on the things we talked about at lunchtime, and then I thought, oh my God, is this safe for Cindy to do so, given that Roy had stepped out of the room, you know, because Roy, it's Roy's program. But, we worked it through, and we sort of did the, the safety elements you know, of it. So sitting on this committee, this uh, oval table right now, are two federal agencies. You all might know Kevin Lenitro. He's the chief economist for the New Orleans Corps, but he also is a CFM. And he's now sitting on the Corps' National Non-Structural Committee. So you all made inroads in getting these, these, you know, these people involved. The National Park Service has a representative because we now have the Gulf of Mexico Task Force that's going to try to restore the ecosystems down there. We also have um, a, a member of the Mitigation uh, Department of the, of the SHMO in the Department of Homeland Security. We have a representative of the Coastal Protection Office. I haven't approached Cindy O'Neill yet. She's the only one I have not approached. And we also have somebody from the Office of Community Development who well, happens to be, like Alessandro, one of the doctor students in the program. Okay, now in addition to that, we have French, we have Larry Buss. Larry is literally physically fighting flood, flooding up in the Missouri with his tractors, okay? I swear, it's physical fighting of it. He emails me just yesterday and says, how's the oval table going? I, please remember, I'm part of it. I'm just right now up to my ears in water and we're trying to you know, fight these floods. For those of you who don't know Larry, he was the chair of the Corps' non-structural national committee, and he also currently chairs the uh, ASFPM's flood proofing committee, okay? So, um, in addition to that, we have the uh, LSU Ag Extension and Marine Agents, who have been actively involved in non-structural, and of course, the staff and graduate students from my center, CHARM. Now, the interesting addition, and a group that with whom the 
a National Hazard Mitigation Association is currently involved in are the environmental groups. Here's how it happened. And groups do not want levees in Louisiana. Okay, simple. Levees harm ecosystems. I say that based upon the science I have been exposed to. Um, some people might argue that you can have levees that are leaky levees and it's okay, but show me a leaky levee that really works in terms of ecosystem and, and then I will be, I have changed my professional opinion. So they got a grant from the Blue Moon Foundation to work with communities on something they called How Safe, How Soon. Certainly sounds like what we do, doesn't it? But they didn't know how to make the community safe. They took money and gave us two graduate assistants in chart. And those graduate assistants came to us, met with us, were in our meetings, and took the information over to the environmental groups. Environmental Defense Fund, National Wildlife Federation, Audubon. Okay? Sierra Club sometimes, they're, they're in and out of this, this conversation. When the communities had more questions, what did they do? The graduate students came back over, made appointments with all of us, asked the questions, got the information, went back and forth. Now you might anticipate that we have two graduates of our program who are fully informed about non-structural and about mitigation as a result of their role, but now we have incredibly knowledgeable environmental groups who know what we know about non-structural. I've even said and meant it completely that they write pieces that are better than what I could write. What reasons? They have marketing people, PR people, I don't care what the reasons are, it's there. Okay? And I understand that what they're now doing is they've engaged you all to continue this conversation and to have a white paper for national uses. Okay? So they're at the table. So one of the, the young men who is part of this group, the National Wildlife Federation, who is a resident of Homa, is Chris and Dick are, is the co-chair of this group. Now, the benefit of that is, is that he's young. A third of this group are very young. Let me make Alessandra be part of that. She's borderline now. She's getting old because of how much she works. <laughs> then there's a third who are middle a middle career, and then there's the rest of us who, who are not um, young. Okay. But as you, as you have all been saying, we have to do this. We've got to get younger people involved. We just can't keep on thinking that somehow, magically, they're going to pop up one day and be all knowledgeable you know, about this, this process. Now, before today, my goal was, uh, our goal, excuse me, nothing that my doing here, was to have, um, to, to agree upon having a solicitation for five mitigation projects, or five projects to reduce risk in five different communities in coastal, in Louisiana. It doesn't have to be coastal, in Louisiana. And that we would agree, it's like a blood pact here, we would agree that if this happens, we will not leave these five communities for five years. Sounds like, like a program, doesn't it, Cindy? There's something about five years that's sort of magical, you know. And that we would also have a declaration of principles of the interaction that we would have with these communities. Uh, this declaration of principles has, again, a concept that's been worked through with Chris and Dick, and Rosina has been very key to it. We sort of start with a draft, and then after the draft, we would end up then working with the communities to refine it. So the idea would be to engage Louisiana communities further from where they are in non-structural. But we're challenged by two different things. One I'm excited about, and that is that all this group has all these agency silos. And we're asking them to come to the table and drop some of that silo. I mean, obviously, they have resources, they have knowledge, they have responsibilities, but to work as a team, and I'm envisioning that we would break up so many, uh, so many individuals per, um, per community. But the other challenge is, is we can't sell non-structurals for the benefit they are if we don't know what that benefit is. And to repeat Dennis's statement, we need science on benefits, both the monetary but also the other kinds of benefits that, that can come, come to pass. Thank you very much.